Muy buenas tardes para todos. En cinco minutos daremos inicio con la conferencia. Muchas gracias. Muy buenas tardes para todos. Le damos la bienvenida a nuestro Distinguished Lecture Program en su versión virtual. Reciban un cordial saludo por parte de la Sociedad de Ingenieros de Petróleo, Sección Colombia y Sección Noris Colombia. Les agradecemos por haber atendido nuestro llamado y esperamos que puedan aprender de esta conferencia titulada Enhancing All Recovery for Unconventional Reservoir, The Next Big Thing. Antes de empezar, les recordamos que la lecture será en inglés, puesto es el idioma de nuestro speaker y se estarán recibiendo por medio del chatbot, que serán recibidas al final de la presentación. Ahora les presentaré a Todd Hoffman. He is an associate professor in petroleum engineer department at Montana Tech. He teaches classes on reservoir simulation, enhancing or recovery, and unconventional reservoir. Prior to that, he was a reservoir engineer consultant to the oil and gas industry. Todd has worked on reservoir model for more than 30 fields in six continents 
and he has published over 15 technical papers. His research involves in proper recovery for conventional and unconventional reservoir modeling and history mesh. Todd received his BS in Petroleum Engineer from Montana Tech and his master degree and PhD in Petroleum Engineer for Stanford University. Todd, you can start now. Awesome. Well, thank you, Sandra, for that kind introduction. And I also want to thank Sandra for organizing this over the last couple of weeks. She's did a lot of work to put all this together. So, so I really appreciate that. Um, and I also want to thank all of you uh, that are attending in the audience out there. I, I realize this is not the way that we had wanted to do it or that we planned to do it. it. I wanted to be in Columbia, seeing all your smiling faces. And it's one of my great disappointments about this whole um, pandemic that I'm not able to come down and, and to visit you. Uh, but I do appreciate your flexibility and willing to uh, attend this as a, as a webinar. And um, I'm excited to talk to you guys today about enhanced oil recovery and unconventional reservoirs. So just kind of a quick outline. Again, mostly I'm gonna be talking about enhanced oil recovery and unconventional reservoirs. And really trying to focus on the field trials, kind of what's been happening you know, in the actual wells, in the field, in the reservoirs. Um, but I do at the beginning, I have a little background, just talk a little bit about what are unconventional reservoirs, maybe even talk about conventional reservoirs a little bit, just kind of make sure we're all on the same page. Uh, then I'll talk a little bit about kind of the operational aspects. So what are some of the things that we need to think about as we're implementing EOR into our unconventional fields? And at the end, I'll talk a little bit about kind of physically what's happening, like what's going on in the reservoir that's causing additional oil uh, to be produced. How is that oil getting from the matrix into our well bores? Um, so, but first, let's just kind of take a step back and maybe revisit our first geology class or geology 101. And this is just a diagram of all the sedimentary basins that you may have that may exist. So, you know, things are being eroded and washed out to the, to the ocean and the big particles like sand and silts are being deposited near the shore. So near in the beaches and the deltas. And, uh, but further out, the smaller particles can make it out to the very slow moving water here in the deep marine. And those slow particle, or those small particles start to deposit out there. Because they're small, the, poros the permeability and porosity is really small out there in those portions of the of this depositional environment system. Now, if we were lucky, at the same time, this deep marine was in, near the equator or a very warm climate and lots of organic material was, was growing, you know, algae and plankton and that type of stuff and was dying, was falling to the bottom of the ocean at the same time that those tiny particles were going. And over time, the beaches and the deltas and the reefs all push out over the deep marine and bury it deeper and deeper. And over time, pressure increases, the temperature increases, and that organic material gets converted into the oil and gas that we produce today. Right? So here the source rock basically is that deep marine portion that's been buried. That process of converting from organic material into the hydrocarbons is a volume expansion. So that causes the pressure to increase even more and it pushes out the hydrocarbons that are generated along faults into more permeable conventional reservoirs, right? The, the beaches and the deltas and that we've been producing for the last 150 years in the oil industry. But no matter how much of the hydrocarbon has left, even more has remained at the source. Um, and we've known that as we've drilled through the source rocks into deeper formations, we see a little oil, we know the oil is there, but we've never really been able to exploit it or produce it until we combine two technologies, long re extended reach horizontal drilling and multi-stage hydraulic fracturing. So we can drill a well into that formation, we can frack it, and that allows us to produce from that source rock. And so that's basically what I'm calling unconventional reservoirs. Now it's a vague term, it can mean different things to different people. Um, so, and you may hear it called shale oil reservoirs or resource rock or tide oil. 
Um, when I gave this presentation in Russia, they call them hard to produce reservoirs. So I don't know, maybe in Russian that has a little better ring to it, but we basically called lots of different things. But for this presentation, I'm gonna call them unconventional reservoirs. And really it's when the source rock and the reservoir rock are essentially the same. The source rocks have very, very low permeability, you know, in the micro and nano Darcy range. So very, very low. And really to be able to produce these reservoirs, we need to have to drill long horizontal wells and do some type of hydraulic fracturing. So that combination all together is kind of what I'm considering unconventional reservoirs. So that's what are unconventional reservoirs. Now, where are unconventional reservoirs? Well, basically, because they're the source rocks for all of our conventional production, wherever we have conventional production, we also have source rocks. Now, for the most part, those have only been exploited in kind of North America and Canada and the US, we've had lots of production. But there's some additional um, kind of last five years, I'd say in Russia, China, and maybe a little longer in, in, the, in the Nuquin Basin in Argentina. Uh, but basically, you know, even here in Colombia, we have those types of uh, reservoirs or the, the resource that's potential to go out and, and drill those types of um, formations. So just to talk a little bit more about Columbia, the, uh, I guess the other disappointing thing for me about not being able to come to Columbia is I love to talk to, to the you know, geoscientists and engineers about kind of what, what your resources are. And, and so unfortunately, I just had to pull this kind of stuff off the internet. Um, but it looks like that there is a pretty good potential unconventional resource, the um, La Luna formation in the, you know, kind of here in this middle Magdalena Valley. And there may be some other potential in Llano Basin or here in the Oriental uh, Cordel Cordillera uh, or up here. You know, there's other maybe potential areas, but, um, you know, at, at the end, if we have some time, you know, if you have any kind of feedback on what's happening, I'd love to hear that. Or, or you can send me an email or we can follow up with that. Um, but, um, and maybe I'm off base again, this is just, Kind of what I've been able to uh, glean from from what I was, you know, looking around on the internet. So, so as I mentioned, though, most of the work in unconventional reservoirs has been in North America, and so I've listed a number of the formations here in North America. And really, in this presentation, we're really going to focus on two of those: the Bakken, which is here in kind of Montana, North Dakota, and a little bit up in Canada. Um, and the Eagleford, which is down here in South Texas. And those two are really the earliest oil unconventional resources for the, for the liquid rich um, areas. And so they're really the first places where there's been a need for some type of enhanced oil recovery where most of the work is going on. But all of these other formations that I've listed here, you know, in Canada and the US have had production in the oil uh, window. And, um, you know, there is some potential for EOR and all of those. Um, in all of those zones. So, you know, I'm from Montana. I, you know, I, I went to school here. I did my undergraduate. I went and worked. I came back and I teach there. And so I'd like to talk, tell a little story about the history or the origin of unconventional reservoirs. Many people think that has to do with a person named um, Mitchell in the Barnett Formation in kind of Texas around Dallas, Fort Worth area. But there's a, a guy at the same time, maybe even a little bit earlier in Montana, who started developing the Bakken. Um, and he, his name is Richard Findlay. And um, he, the petroleum geologist, been drilling in the kind of the Williston Basin, Montana, North Dakota area for his whole career. And he always drilled through this Bakken formation, get a little show of oil, but not very much. And he was like, man, if there's a way to produce that, that Bakken, man, that, there's a lot, I think there's a lot of oil there. So finally he partnered with a company and convinced them to drill a horizontal well into this formation in the Elm Cooley field, which is you know, just right here on the, the Eastern part of, Mo of Montana. And that well that they drilled in, in 1999 started producing about 100, 150 barrels a day. So it's not a huge well, but it was pretty good. And it was, you know, you know when wells were typically coming on at 20 or 30 barrels, it was a good, it was a good, um, a good well. And then in, um, 2000, so a few months later produced, he's like, you know, if we could frack that well, it might do even better. Now this isn't the multi-stage, you're not going in and doing multiple fractures along the well, just a single pump a bunch of sand and fluid down the well, try to break open the rock and produce as much as you can. And then the well came back on 
producing over 400 barrels per day, which is a really economic, a really good well at the time. So, was, you know, again, back in 99, 2000, and kind of over the next five years, the, the land rush was on. You know, there's lots of um, wells. Each one of these circles represents a well that have been drilled, and the size is basically how much oil is producing. And you can see on the North Dakota side, hardly anything in 2005, but the Montana, there was there was a lot of a lot of development. And just to give a little more of my background, so in 1999, I was graduating from Montana Tech uh, with my bachelor's degree. And at the time, you know, my friends and I that we were graduating with, we, you know, we knew if we we're going to work in the oil industry, we weren't going to work continental U.S. because all those fields have been found. They're all on high water cuts. You know, they've been water flooded for a long time. Really nothing exciting going on. Most likely, if we're going to work in the oil industry, we're going to work offshore, kind of Gulf of Mexico, or more likely international. I mean, that's where everything is moving to. And I went to work in Houston for an oil company. Um, I was working on a little CO2 flood project. It was interesting. I, I liked the, the project, but the, um, as I say, Houston, Texas, and I didn't really match. And so I had an opportunity to go to graduate school. Uh, out here in California. So I uh, jumped at the opportunity and went out and did my master's, my PhD. And when I graduated in 2005, I'd planned to go back to work in industry, but there was a job opening for a professor back in my old university. And I kind of thought, well, I just applied as a whim, just, you know, maybe I'll get lucky. And, and turns out I ended up getting the job and I came back to Montana in 2005 um, to, to teach. And, and really the world had changed. There'd been, you know, in Montana, all this development in this unconventional Ampuli field that had really changed the economy of Montana. Um, the governor was talking about it. And I kind of thought, oh, this is something that's happening kind of all over. But it turns out it's really only happening in, in Montana. But very quickly, it went across the border into North Dakota. So now we're at 2010. And again, the circles represent the wells and how much they're producing. And you can see the Elm Cooley field, very, you know, production is way down now. So five years later, very few new wells. The colors represent how much uh, gas is in it. So the yellow have a lot more gas associated with it. But on the, on the North Dakota side, particularly over here in the partial Sanish area, a lot of high productive wells coming on online. Um, and this is really when I realized, oh, this is kind of a, you know, this is a big deal. This unconventional development has really changed our industry. And, and I, you know, I grew up on a, on a cattle ranch, um, kind of in the middle of nowhere, no, pretty far from any oil industry. And um, I really like my friends that I, I mean, they didn't know what a petroleum engineer did. They thought that meant you're pumping gas at the petrol station. But during this time, kind of 2008, 2009, 2010, um, we were having a, major recession, jobs were hard to get. So a lot of my friends ended up going out to North Dakota just with a high school degree and getting jobs working on drilling rigs and frack crews and working just hauling water and doing a bunch of jobs and coming back to my small little town with these big big pickup trucks and fancy equipment and stuff. And and by then they knew really, oh yeah, the, the oil industry is is a big part of of, of um, you know of, of the industry. Um, and really, I guess for me, the kind of the biggest thing that happened was one day I was home, you know, it was like Christmas or, or some holiday, and I was talking to my mom. She was a she's a school teacher and a, a rancher's wife, no not, no technical knowledge. But one day she just asked me. She kind of said, "How do you drill a well horizontal, anyways?" And it just blew my mind that my mom knew that we we're drilling horizontal wells for one, let alone that it would be hard. And so I tried to explain like, well, you just turn a little bit every, every foot and pretty soon, you know, you're going horizontal, but uh, you know, I don't know if she got it or not, but it really opened my eyes. Like, yeah, this, you know, development that's happening um, in the, in the, you know, Bakken in Montana, North Dakota is going to be, is going to be a huge, a huge deal. Um, just to kind of finish my story. So my wife, she's a geophysical engineer and graduated with me in 99 and never really worked in the industry. And in 2000, kind of the mid 2000s, decided she wanted to become a physician, a doctor. Um, so she applied to medical school and got accepted here in Seattle in Washington. And, you know, there's no really no oil and gas in anywhere in this region. So I just kind of worked as a consultant. I worked for a small firm that did kind of uh, mostly fractured reservoir modeling. 
Um, and then when she finished her medical degree, um, she has to do residency, like the practical training. So she moved to Colorado or we moved to Colorado here and she finished that up. And I worked at Colorado School of Mines as a professor. And then in um, 2014, that she finished that and we moved back to Montana and I started teaching again at Montana Tech where I've been for the last six years. So, so that's kind of a, my whole uh, background and, and, and story there. So I mentioned we'd also talk about the Eagle Ferd. So this is 2011 in the Eagle Ferd. And what I'm showing here are the wells and the blue are the permitted wells. So these haven't been drilled, but they've requested from the state that they're able to drill those wells. The red are gas wells that have been drilled and the green, there's a few green, it's hard to see, but there's a few of them in there. And again, this is a year after the, um, the Bach and the one we just showed. So now we jump forward four years to 2015 and really the, the boom had been on, right? All these additional wells have been drilled today. There's almost 20,000 wells drilled in this, um, in this region. And just to give you some idea of scale, this here is about 600 kilometers uh, by about 100 kilometers. So it's a huge, huge area that's been um, developed uh, in, in, you know, in this. And, and again, we, we, all the other basins, the Permian, the Montany up in Canada, we had similar kinds of stories where, you know, over about a five to 10 year span, the development just kind of took over. There's been, you know, huge amount of, um, of unconventional development happening in the, in the U.S. over, over that time. And just to kind of hammer that point home. This slide just shows the oil production in the US from 1920 through today, so for 100 years. And you can see from you know 50 years, there's a steady incline up to 1970, when it peaked at 10 million barrels a day. Then it had been on a pretty steady decline. This little peak here you know, is, is um, associated when Alaska oil came on, kind of the north slope of Alaska. For the last 30 years, it had been on a, on a steady decline. And then kind of 2000, 2010 timeframe, it flattened out again. And over the last 10 years, it's just peaked back up. And really all of this additional production is from unconventional. And if today we're over, we're, we're over 13 million barrels a day. So, you know, even exceeded our, our 1970 peak. And that's the production. If we look at the volume of oil in these reservoirs, there, it's tremendous. There's hundreds of billions of barrels in each one of these basins, right? Just to, for scale, like the Guar field in, in uh, Saudi Arabia, the biggest conventional field is about a hundred billion barrel. So each one of these has, you know, two or 300 billion barrels in there. So there's just a huge volume of oil that can be produced. So that's the good news, right? That's the good news. So the question though is why, you know, why am I talking about EOR? What's the, what's the problem? What's the issue? Well, while these wells come on at higher rates, they drop off very quickly. And within a year or two, you know, they're down to, you know, tens of barrels a day. And you have to keep drilling new wells, new wells to try to keep the production up. And the second thing is that the recovery factors are really low, like, you know, we're probably getting five, six, maybe 10% of the oil out of the ground. Right? So we're leaving 90% of the oil in the ground, even kind of the best case scenario. Um, so, you know, that's, you know, it's embarrassing. When we talk to people like my mom, who's just, you know, kind of a, what I call a lay person, and they don't know anything about the oil industry. It's embarrassing to say, yeah, we're working as hard as we can, and we're only able to get out 10% of the oil, right? We need to do better as an industry to try to increase that. And, um, and we've done that, we've did that in conventional reservoirs kind of over the last 70 years also, and that's enhanced oil recovery, injecting something into the reservoir to try to get more of the oil out. And we don't need to reinvent the wheel here in unconventionals. We have a lot of experience from conventional reservoirs about how to do that. And a lot of it is just water, right? We inject water into the reservoir, conventional reservoirs, and that causes additional oil to be produced. Sometimes we alter that water with some chemicals like surfactants or polymers. So that may be an option for unconventional reservoirs. The other thing that we do quite a bit um, for our conventional reservoirs is some type of gas injection. And that gas could be CO2 or it could be just produced gas, hydrocarbon gas, or maybe methane or something like that. So there's some different options 
the third kind of category of EOR is thermal recovery. And I don't really have it up to here, but there may be some options there we could again talk about in the Q and A if, if anybody is, um, if you guys are interested. So this is kind of the starting point for us for looking at developing our unconventional reservoirs. So again, let's go back to Montana. So back in kind of 2006 timeframe, um, we had a student that was going to school there uh, and he got a summer internship with a company that had been working in the Elm Cooley field. And, and that company saw, I mean, we kind of saw that these wells had this peak and they're coming down and, and Elm Cooley is really where they saw it first. So his project for the summer was to evaluate uh, is EOR an option or what are the options we could do there? To be honest, I'm not exactly sure what he did over the summer, but when he came back the next fall, he was really excited about this topic and decided he wanted to stay and do his master's around this idea of EOR and conventionals. And so we took a portion of the Elm Cooley field and we built a model and tried out different things, looked at you know different uh, injection schemes, different types of gases, water, you know, just a whole range of kind of options. And now looking back on it, you know, 15 years later, like, okay, yeah, there's things we would have done differently. We could have built the model, you know, in a better way. But the general conclusion was, you know, it, it looks like that there's a possibility to increase the oil, right? Depending on how you do it, you know, it kind of gives us some hope that, that there is something we could do to try to increase recovery. And really his master's thesis and the subsequent SBE paper that came out of that are really the first uh, papers on EOR in unconventional and kind of you know, kicked off some of the work that's been happening over the last 10 plus years. And it wasn't just you know, modeling in the lab, people were trying stuff in the field. Here's a couple of early pilots. Um, so calling them kind of, you know, sweep, these were basically cases where they trucked out CO2 and they injected CO2 into a well and then produced back. So they injected maybe one or two million standard cubic feet a day um, for a month or so and then produced back. Um, at, at the time, there were people who were saying, well, you can't do EOR, you can't inject anything into these reservoirs because the permeability is so is so low. There really there's nowhere for the fluids to go into because these are these micro and nano Darcy permeabilities. But this early work at least showed that you could inject stuff into the reservoir without you know too high of a pressure. Unfortunately, when you turned it back on, very little additional oil was produced. Um, and now I guess we know that you know, we probably didn't inject enough fluids in there. But again, really this was just more of an injectivity test to see if we could inject something in the reservoir. And we're really able to answer that. Okay, and this is kind of 2008 timeframe, 2009, 10, we kind of had a big recession here. Not a lot was going on in the, in the field um, during that time, but it wasn't like we just kind of gave up on it. There was still lots of stuff going on in the research labs, at universities, you know, and there's the government center. So there's still a lot of work going on, particularly with like surfactants and, and water and brine and, and um, there's some analytical work and, and there's quite a few reservoir flow simulation models that were happening at the same time. So I showed you that one we talked about with, with Shabazz, but you know, there's probably another half a dozen or 20 papers that came out kind of in that time frame that, um, that talked about that. And they all were kind of generally the same. They're showing additional recovery. They look pretty good. But the question always was, was is this really capturing the, true response because there's no data, there's no data to validate, to history match the models to, to test the models on. So you could kind of put whatever you want in there. And since you had nothing to, no historical data to test it against, whatever you showed, you know, could be, could be good or not. So, you know, the, we really needed some data to be able to validate these models on. So again, things started to pick up a little bit and kind of over the last, you know, 10 years, there's been a number of pilots in the Bakken, some in Montana, some in North Dakota, um, some with CO2, some with natural gas, some with water, surfactants, kind of a, a pretty broad range of things people tried uh, in North Dakota. And I'm just gonna pick out one of those pilots and talk about it. Uh, in this particular area, there were three wells that were, that were together. 
um, and they've been producing on primary for about three to five years, four years, something like that. And then they decided to take the middle well and inject into it. So this, you know, was their injection well. What I'm showing here in these pictures is actually the two producing wells. So this A1 is the one on the left and B1 is the one here on the right. And what happened as soon as they started injecting, we saw water at these offset wells. I mean, within days, you see this big spike of water coming up for both wells. And again, this kind of makes sense. We put in these big, massive hydraulic fractures. We crack the rock. We put in these really high perm features that connected up the wells. So as soon as we started injecting water, the water found this path and started quickly going over to our producing wells and then producing all this water. And it's basically blocking off the oil. So we weren't really getting any additional production. Um, but they didn't give up. They said, well, let's try something else. Let's try to cement off those zones that are taking most of the water in the injector, try injecting at a lower rate. So they did a second injection and they didn't have that same problem of water breakthrough, but really didn't see any additional oil production either. What I like about this pilot was even after that, they didn't give up. They said, okay, let's try one more thing. Let's inject some gas, just produce gas back into the reservoir in, or into the well and see what happens. And this well B1, the exact same thing happened, right? We injected gas and it um, just broke through quickly to the well and you didn't see really any additional oil production. But on this well, you do see a little kick up of oil production. It's not a lot, but it's, it's significant. And again, kind of gives us some hope that maybe there's some potential to see some additional recovery um, with this. And again, there's other things going on. There's other wells being drilled nearby. So maybe that's influencing it. You know, we can't tell for sure, but um, it does give us some hope that we can do something. The second thing it does is it gives us a piece of data. It gives us some data now that we can history match our models to. So we have more confidence in the, in the models and, and their predictions. So that's what we did. We built the model of that little three well uh, area, the injection well in the middle and the two producing wells on the outside and we put in the geologic properties and you know the you know average porosity and permeability and and to, to model that breakthrough that we saw we had to put in these big massive hydraulic fractures in the dual permeability grid um, so if you're a flow modeler flow simulation hopefully you know what that means we're putting these really high features in the the dual porosity system. If you're not, it doesn't matter. It's just the way we are capturing this behavior where the water breaks through and the gas breaks through really quickly um, in our flow simulation model. And then we're able to history match those behaviors. And again, now we have some confidence that we can use this model to do some predictions. So that's what we did. We took this model and we tried a bunch of different things. We looked at kind of you know, continuous gas injection. That's the first thing we did is just do what they did, inject into this middle well and see if we could get additional production from the offset wells. Um, but for all of those cases, regardless of what gas we were using or how much we were injecting or what types of fluid, they all did worse than just keeping all three wells producing on primary. And again, that makes sense, right? Because We've taken one well offline, so now we're only producing from two wells, and we're cycling a lot of that fluid through the reservoir, um, so we're not really getting a good sweep. Um, so then we tried something else, and this I'm going to take a moment just to kind of take a step aside and talk about huff and puff injection. So huff and puff injection was invented a long time ago, maybe in the 60s or 70s, and it was actually in heavy oil reservoirs, very thick kind of viscous type reservoirs where they try to do steam injection. You inject into a well, but because it's so viscous, it's hard to move that oil to the offset wells. So they started by just injecting into a well and then producing back from that same one. Injecting into the well, and producing back. So you do three or four cycles maybe and get things loosened up, not only on your injectors, but also on your producers. It's kind of all the wells in a heavy oil reservoir, you start with a cyclic or huff and puff steam injection to kind of get things going. Well, someone had the idea that maybe you could try the same thing in these unconventional reservoirs, but instead of using steam, just use uh, CO2 or natural gas. Uh, so that's what we, we tried that. And, and we even actually tried it with water um, and we changed the injection lengths 
and, ch and changed the um, time change that was that we had changed the injection rates, a bunch of different things. But for all the cases where we injected into all three wells and then produced back from all three wells, they did better than the primary production. So again, it's just a model. It's not necessarily the truth or the reality, but it gives us some confidence, some hope that as we move forward, this may be an option that we can use to try to increase recovery from these types of reservoirs. So this is all Bakken. Let's move back to the Eagleford. The Eagleford is where there's been the most amount of success with EUR. Um, and as of today, there's been more than 12 pilots. A bunch of different companies have tried it, but they've all, while the Bakken had a bunch of different things, Bakken was trying water and gas. In the Eagleford, it's all been the same. It's all been huff and puff gas injection and all been with hydrocarbon gases. Uh, and we'll look at a couple of pilots, some of the early pilots and, and stuff, but it kind of started, um, well, it started back in 2013, but in, in May of 2016, a company in their investor relations presentation put this plot up there and said, you know, we figured out EOR on conventionals. We're going to get about 50% more production than we normally would have gotten. You know, somewhere between 30 and 70% more than if we just continued on primary. And so if our wells are producing 400,000 barrels, now they're going to make 600,000 barrels, like the, the cum amount. Um, but there was no data with it. This is just kind of a cartoon picture. They didn't explain exactly how they were doing it. And, uh, and I was very skeptical. I'm like, well, yeah, their stock price has been down. Maybe they're trying to get their stock price up. There's, you know, you know and, and for a few months, for quite a while, I just kind of, I didn't really put much into it. Then finally, a friend of mine from Oklahoma City, he's like, well, why don't you just go look at the data, right? The data is public in this, you know, in all the states in the US. Each state, Texas has its own um, place where it stores all the data. So you can go and look at that. And so he kind of pointed me in the right direction for where those wells are. And this is just a single well. It was isolated. There was no wells nearby it. And again, the well came on primary, producing about 700 barrels a day. And then, um, had, but dropped off quickly. And then in kind of early 2013, they injected some gas and the rates went up to about 400 barrels a day. Dropped off again, so they did a second injection and then a third. And all of those cycles really saw a significant amount of additional oil production. This particular location was pretty close to a gas plant that they had, the company had. So the company had actually been stripping off the heavier ends, the C3, C4, C5, you know, components and really just injecting a pretty lean gas, mostly methane, you know, 90, 95% methane. Um, and then they'd send the gas back, take off the heavy ends and then re-inject the lean gas. But they had enough success here that they said, okay, let's go try this at some other nearby locations. So in these two um, pilots, there's a number of wells. The one on the left, there's eight wells in the pilot. And the one on the right, there's 14 wells within the lease. The way Texas reports their production data, you don't have to report it per well, but actually per lease. So in these particular cases, you can see this is the whole production of all those wells. The green line is the data. The purple is just a harmonic decline that I fit through the data. Um, but you can clearly see when the uh, injection started in both of these cases. You know, in this case over here, if we just could continue to produce on primary, we've been getting about 400 barrels a day, but by doing the gas injection, we're getting over a thousand barrels per day. And in case B here, I think something interesting is, you know, they did the injection for about a year and a half, two years, and then they stopped, they moved their compressors somewhere else. But when they stopped, they didn't just go back to the purple line, they actually formed a new decline curve. And so that to me tells me that that's not just acceleration. You're not just getting the oil out faster, but you're actually getting more oil out. You're getting incremental oil that you otherwise wouldn't have gotten if you hadn't done the um, EOR process. Uh, so there's one final pilot in the Eagle Fur that I want to talk about, same company. This though pilot is, is 100 miles away. It's pretty far away. And there they don't have that gas plant. So in this particular case, they're just re-injecting the produced gas, just the gas that they're coming out of their wells, they're re-injecting it. And because there's these four wells are all, they're injecting it all four wells and producing back all at the same time, 
the um, the uh, results are a little easier for us to analyze. And so this is just the average of one well, you know, started producing about 400 barrels per day, have been on decline. They injected for a few months here, in kind of late 2014, early 2015, turned the wells back on, and then the rates jumped up. And they did seven cycles like this, and all, cy all seven cycles showed significant additional production. And just over that kind of three years of injection, they already produced 30% more than they would have if they had discontinued on primary production. And because this data is a little cleaner and easier to work with, we can do some very simple prediction modeling. So this is just decline curve uh, modeling using the through the peaks of the production and assuming that they would inject for two months and produce two months back and forth, kind of like they were doing here in the, in the pilot part. And over 20 years, you see that there's gonna be an additional 50% recovery. So this number that they talked about in that initial um, investor relations presentation actually is pretty clear from the data that, that we have. And also because this pilot is pretty clean and easy to work with, we can do some very simple economics. And now these, you know, we had to make some assumptions about how much the compressor cost, how much they were injecting, um, kind of what other operating costs. Uh, we put all that additional um, information in it and basically ran the economics and at $50 a barrel, which was kind of the price at the time, it's, you know, it's mar what I call marginal economy. It looks pretty good. You're making additional money. Um, it's nothing fantastic, uh, but it looks, you know, it looks pretty good. And realize this is just a pilot. So this isn't, we haven't tried to optimize anything here. We're not improving, you know, in this particular case, they waited a long time before they started the gas injection. So they took a lot of gas to repressurize the system. So maybe if they'd have started a year sooner, they might have been able to produce even more or you know, make it even more economic. Because a lot of that cost was just filling up the, the, the gap, you know, filling up the formation, getting the pressure to, to come back up over time. So over time, it should become more and more economically efficient. And as of today, I mean, this has kind of expanded all over the Eagleford. There's over probably actually close to 300 wells today that they've done some type of huff and puff gas injection in. At least five different companies have tried it. Uh, and, and there's been other companies that have kind of in various stages of planning. So things look good. It looks like we're producing additional oil in most cases. But what are the issues? What are the situations that cause problems? What are things to think about if you're planning to implement some type of EOR in your unconventional reservoir? So kind of, as I say, three things to focus on. You know, conformance, conformance, conformance. Just like in real estate, location, location, location. Really, it's about keeping the gas where you've injected it. If you're injecting gas and it's, it's horizontal, you're leaving horizontally to other wells, or even worse, vertically, it's going out and going to other formations, uh, and you're not able to build pressure, then basically you're not gonna see a lot of additional oil production. But you need to get the pressure built up that you're above the bubble point so the gas will go back into solution. And then once you start producing the well, then the gas comes back out of solution, pushes the oil into the well bores. So, you know, there's a, you, you really need to be able to, to, to build pressure. That's a big part of it. Also the gas is costly. So if you're injecting gas and losing it and not getting it back, that's just gonna hurt your economics because really the gas, you need to keep the gas where, where it is. And I have a couple of examples that kind of show this. This is a Bakken pilot, it was pretty recent. And they started injecting in this middle Leon well. Um, and this is the pressure monitor in this Leon well. So you can see when the well first started injecting it was already down to 400 PSI. And they were only able to get the pressure to go up to about 1800 PSI. But the actual um, bubble point pressure was about 24, 2500 PSI. So they actually never got the gas to go back into solution. So that's one problem. They didn't have enough gas to, to build that or a big enough compressor. The other problem is that all these wells are connected. So when we started injecting some of these other wells, we're seeing the pressure response here at this well. So that's telling us that all those wells are connected up. Even gas that's being injected, you know, hundreds of feet away, still we see the response uh, here in this particular well. And that's basically what I'm showing here. That's the additional pressure. So, you know, 
a number of issues, but really didn't see much additional oil production in this particular case because they never were able to build. So now that company is going back and redesigning things and, and making sure they have enough gas and the big enough compressor. So they're trying, I think they're planning to do a, a trial too um, to, um, to determine you know, if it really can work in the Balkan. Here's a similar kind of uh, project in the Eagle Ford. And this company, they um, started injecting in the middle wells again. And, and this actually is a picture from a model that the University of Texas put together. So this isn't, isn't our work, but you can see that it put in these big fractures that connected up all the wells to try to match that breakthrough behavior. And when they did that, and actually in the case, though, they ended up shutting in all those wells and even more because the gas kept going further and further horizontally. And again, they just couldn't build pressure um, to, to um, and again, didn't see much additional oil production. So some possible solutions. Well, if you can isolate your wells, where you're just saying, okay, here are these six wells that are isolated and treat them as a single system, that may be an option. In this particular case, probably not. These are all the wells were drilled in that area. So, I mean, they're all connected up. You know, these wells are maybe a hundred meters apart. So they're close, there's lots of wells. Um, so the other thing that they talked about is maybe some type of pressure containment. Maybe you can inject some water or some high visc fluid in the end wells, and that hopefully would keep the gas in between that, those, you know, in the middle part of the wells, and you can build the pressure up and get the gas to go back into solution. And the other thing that I think people aren't paying quite enough attention to is the initial frack job, how they originally frack these wells. Um, so what we want is we want a lot of surface area, a lot of fracture surface area close to the well bore. Right, that gives us the interface where our gas can fill up the fracture and go in and contact the matrix and then come back into the fracture. So the more surface area, the better we have. If we, but if we have wells connecting up to other wells during the frac job, then um, when we're injecting here, it's just gonna quickly go to these other wells. Right? So we don't want wells kind of intersecting with other wells. And not only is that good for secondary or EOR, it's also good for primary. But the more surface area you have, the more, the higher your initial rates um, um, should be. And you know, the company that, that we were talking about here, they were the first ones to go to this plug and perf with lots of perf clusters, lots of sand, trying to create these types of um, fractures in their, in their wells. And they're also some of the most successful EOR uh, wells also. So that kind of feeds into that. And actually I was having lunch with a company who was working in the, there in the Bach and on, this is maybe 2011, 2010, 2012, somewhere in there. And, um, and they were saying, yeah, we're, we're moving away from uh, this kind of ball drop sliding sleeve system, which basically everyone was using at the time. And I was kind of surprised. I'm like, oh, that's surprising. Like everyone I know is using this Kind of ball drop sliding sleeve type system and they were like no no not everyone like the company just across the lease line from us they're doing plug and perf and their wells are coming on primary production much higher than ours are so we we switched everything over to plug and perf now over time you know 10 years later we realized yeah that's what everybody's doing now but it, it took someone to realize that that was kind of the way to go and, and it not only is it good for primary production also good for the uh, the EOR. So just a couple slides here at the end. I don't know if you guys know how the Distinguished Lecture program works, but I didn't know. But I was nominated for this two years ago, over two years ago now. And so a lot of things happen if you're doing research and stuff. So over the last couple of years, we've been kind of really focusing on kind of physically what's happening in the reservoir that's causing additional oil to be produced. And, and there's different ways to think about it, but basically we're injecting some gas into these wells. They fill up the fractures. Um, and then in the fracture, they're interacting with the matrix. So that's kind of where the, the money is being made. And it could be that the gas, and this is what we talked about, is dissolving into the oil and you need to get above the bubble point pressure for the gas to go in. And then when you turn the wells back on, the gas comes out of solution, it swells the oil, pushes the oil into the fractures, which go to the wells. So that's kind of one conceptual idea. Another is that we fill these fractures with 
gas. And then we, um, the gas vaporizes some of the light ends, you know, the C4, C5, C6s in with the gas phase. And then we produce the gas back and then those larger molecules drop out and that's the liquids we produce. Uh, and it could be some kind of combination of both of those things happening. So we just kind of went through and listed a bunch of the different mechanisms. So swelling, this secondary solution gas drive, that's the gas going into solution and coming back out again. Um, you know, maybe vaporization, you know, maybe it's just adding pressure into the system, you know, and some other things that we, we kind of talked about. And then we built some models to test out how important these different mechanisms are for different types of systems. So actually we built um, a number, we kind of built three different fluid models, a black oil model, a volatile oil, and a gas condensate. And then for each one of those, we changed the initial gas oil ratio, you know, just by changing the, the, um, the gas oil contact. So we ended up with, you know, 10 or so different uh, fluid models. And in all those, we tried out different um, gas injection schemes and we were able to look, because you can do things in a model that you can't do in real life, we're able to turn on and off different mechanisms. So we could say, we're not gonna allow vaporization to happen. And we're not, or we're not gonna allow pressure support, or we're not gonna allow viscosity reduction. We can try out these different things. And then what we found was that for the black oil systems, really this oil swelling and secondary solution gas drive, is really what's driving the additional oil production. But for the gas condensates, right, which are more, you know, a lot of liquids are dropping out in the, in the reservoir in those types. Vaporization is a more important mechanism. Um, so kind of depending on what type of system you have, you know, you may want to use more of a lean gas, say if you're in the vaporization window, or you may want to use a rich gas that's easier to dissolve in the oil if you're in the more black oil system. And then what I'm showing on the left here is just basically the oil recovered on primary versus the oil recovered with gas injection. And you can see that all the cases, you're getting about twice as much oil out with gas injection as you did versus primary recovery. But notice that for the black oil cases, there's just a lot more oil to get. There's a lot more oil to recover. So while you're still incrementally seeing about 50% more oil in the gas condensates, 50% more oil of the, black, of the black oil, there's just a bigger portion of that. So again, if you have multiple regions, you know, in these types of reservoirs, you really want to focus on more of the black oil region first than the gas condensate is that's where there's just additional, um, you know, additional oil that, that can be recovered. Um, so just a, a few quick conclusions. Uh, I think the potential for enhanced oil recovery in unconventionals is really huge. There's lots of oil in place and we're not getting very much of it today. So we really need to figure out a way to recover that additional oil. In the Eagle Ford, it looks like huff and puff uh, gas injection with natural gas seems to be working pretty well. Uh, large scale development is basically occurring today. Uh, doesn't mean that that's the perfect solution. And as we look at other basins, you know, there may be other solutions that work better. Right? Does do water and surfactants, is that gonna work better in some places? Is that gonna be a more cost-effective solution? So there's still, we're still really just at the very beginning, at the, at the baby stage of understanding this EOR and conventionals. And, and really most of the work still needs to be done, right? It's still ahead of us in the next few years as we try to figure out how to recover additional oil from these types of, um, of reservoirs. So I do want to thank the SPE Foundation and Offshore Europe. They are funding, uh, they funded the trips that I was able to travel on and take. Um, if you want to give me some feedback in the presentation, um, you can go to this website here and provide some feedback. And then finally, I just want to open the floor for any questions, comments that you have. Um, and if you're, you know, if you're not able to get your question answered today, you can email me at this email address. And, um, and I'll be happy to respond as well. So, so that I'll open the floor to any questions. Thanks. Thank you very much, Todd, for the presentation. We have yeah, a you. couple of questions. Great.
The first question is for Andres. He says, Todd, thanks a lot for the presentation. What will happen if you get rich gas instead of lean gas? Will your recovery increase? I think so. Particular for black oil reservoirs. So the rich gas, just ha it's easier for the gas to dissolve into the oil. So you'll get more in um, and it should cause the oil to swell more because you have more of these higher end hydrocarbons and that should you know, push more of the oil into the fractures. Um, I didn't talk about it much. I think CO2 is very similar. It dissolves easily into the oil. And so I think there's some potential for CO2, but it's so corrosive it mixes with water and makes carbonic acid that the facilities retrofit, you have to go back and change all the facilities, really, again, hurts the economics of using CO2. So I think the rich gas just produce gas is, is what most people are doing. I think it's you know, a chance for them for the greatest success. All right, thank you very much. Uh, Mr. Holman, they are ER techniques on this kind of reservoirs could be even more profitable than conventional heavy oil reservoirs? You know, the I guess the difference between heavy oil and these types of reservoirs is that heavy oils, they produce very little primary and you get a lot when you go to steam flooding or, or, or some type of thermal recovery. Um, so the heavy oil reservoirs went to EOR very quickly. This has been a little bit more lagging. You know, we're 20 years, 15, 20 years in, and, and we're really just starting to do EOR. Um, I th so drilling new wells today is probably more economic. If you're in a, the really good acreage, if you're in the good parts of the reservoir, drilling new wells is probably more economic than doing EOR. That being said, if all your good acreage is drilled up, probably better to go and apply EOR in your good acreage than it is to go drill in your, what I call tier two, or that's the not quite as good acreage kind of on the outsides um, of that. So, so compared to heavy oil, I, I mean, I, I do think it's, the potential is really good. If there's, you know, this is economic, but there's a, it's a little different in the way that, um, that it's, it's, I guess, being exploited or being developed. Okay, Andres told us, uh, look like the results in bacon were not as good as an equal full in terms of recovery increase. What will be the main cause? <laughs> That's a great question. Um, so you'll hear different answers. Um, one of the answers is the geology is a little different. It's a little more, potentially more fractured in the Bakken. And so your gas is, is not staying put. Um, and the company that had the most success in Eagleford, they had some pilots in the Bakken too, and they, they abandoned those and went to the Eagleford. And that's their claim that the Eagleford has better geology. I haven't really seen anybody try in the Bakken the same method that's been tried in the Eagleford, where you inject gas in this huff and puff manner um, and you get your gas, make sure you get your pressures above the bubble point pressure. And so until someone's tried that and shown me that it doesn't work as well, I still think the Bakken has as much potential as the Eagleford. Um, but they did, it hasn't been really implemented. No one has implemented it the same way that was implemented in the Eagleford. Uh, so if you try trying the Bakken the same way you tried in Eagleford, I personally think it's gonna be as good or better. But I'm, you know, it's just my, this is my story. So I'm telling that but it's, uh, it may not be. Other people have different opinions about it. And, and geology does play a role. If you have a lot of natural fracturing, there's some areas that are like in the Niobrara in Colorado, lots of natural fracturing. Again, good for primary, but probably not as good for EOR because your gas it may be leaking off to other formations above, above you. Um, so I have a great question. Hiram asks, how did geomechanical studies have helped the UR process? Well, so I have a, I didn't put it in this presentation, I probably should have, but um, I, I have a little idea that I've been trying to promote to people. 
and basically currently we drill our wells in the you know the direction of minimum stress so that we can create these transverse fractures that go along there you know and, and um, it, again that's good for creating a lot of fracture surface area but what happens is you end up connecting up the well bores with these fractures you know they come across and and then everything's all connected up so there's an idea I have about instead of drilling your wells in the direction of minimum stress, instead drill them in the direction of maximum stress. So your fractures are along the well bore. And then when you have another well bore, when you're injecting gas, it can push through from one well bore to the next. And you end up with this kind of flat front type of production. Um, and really it requires an understanding of the geomechanic system. Uh, and I haven't really convinced, I, no, I, haven't, I haven't convinced any company to try it. Um, there are some places where it's being implemented um, in kind of the north slope of Alaska, where they can't sell their gas and they can't flare their gas. They have to re-inject it. Um, so they know even from day one that they're going to be injecting their gas. But those reservoirs are more one millidarcy reservoirs. So they're much more permeable than the micro and nano darcy perm permeability reservoirs of the Eagle Ford and the Permian. Um, but I, I suspect that it could also work in those low permeability reservoirs, though I'm not 100% convinced. So, so that's just, I mean, that's kind of one example. I mean, really understanding the geomechanics does all, you know, all the things we do about fracking these wells, producing the wells, fracking the neighbor wells, then how the stress regime changes as you produce it, if you want to refract. I mean, all that is stuff that's we need to understand better. I think we don't have a great understanding of it today. And I think if we understood it better, we could do a better job, particularly in our primary fracture, our first com uh, fracture completions. So, okay. okay, in that order, Paola asked, Mr. Holman, can you explain which the impact of the well spacing in this kind of project? Yeah, so well spacing is a big question. Everyone wants to know what's our optimum well spacing. And, you know, I think a lot of the wells in the Permian, which we didn't talk much about the Permian, but those wells are getting pretty close together. And if the wells are close together, um, they're interfering with each other. So this well is taking oil that would have been produced by this well. Um, and, and, you know, there's maybe some overlap was okay, but if you have too much, then you're, you're really hurting, again, hurting the economics. For gas injection, or even any of this water injection, EOR, it's even more of a problem when the wells are close together because um, you have this breakthrough issue with gas or water cycling between the wells. Um, and so, you know, having your wells a little further apart where the fracture, you can still fracture this in between area, but you're actually not creating these big frac connections between the wells. Should be better for, um, uh, for EOR. And you should be able to overall get to higher recovery factors than you would have if you put in, you know, three wells in a thousand feet or two wells. Right? Even with two wells, you can still recover that um, same amount. You know, or that's just, you know, depending on your reservoir, of course, those numbers change a lot. But um, again, I don't think we have a very good understanding of well spacing in unconventional reservoirs. So that's some area of some work that people, I mean, there's lots of people working on that. Um, you know, how do you develop a field when you're going to go in and, you know, drill 20,000 wells, like we talked about in Eagleford, so that the, we can recover the most amount of oil the most efficiently. Um, so people are working on that and that's, you know, like in Columbia, you guys have kind of undeveloped unconventional reservoirs, right? They're there, there's been a few wells drilled into them, but I think hopefully all the mistakes that were made in the US and Canada can be exported to places like Columbia where we can do a better job developing those fields. Just hopefully we'll, we'll learn more, we, you know, already learned a lot. But, um, hopefully that answers your question. Okay, Hiram asks, is the gas absorption a bit consideration for the UR? The gas, uh, getting access to the gas? The gas absorption. Absorption, oh, okay, yeah. Um, yeah, I, I, you know, I haven't, so the gas has to go into solution to the oil. I don't know how much gas is absorbing into the 
um, rock, and I know rock's the wrong word because a lot of it's just organic material, the, the kerogen. Um, and when we produce these just on primary, we do think that there's some gas desorbing coming out of solution or coming off of these um, shales and the, and the organic. Um, I, do, I don't think it's an issue in the second going back in when you're injecting. Um, we just, I don't think there's the time for that. And uh, I don't know, that's a question I hadn't thought about. No one's asked me that before. That's a good question. So I don't know if I have a good answer, but um, just off the top of my head, I, I don't think that that's really an issue. It won't be too much of an issue for the EOR process. Mm -hmm. Meliano asks, have you ever test nanomaterials to improve gas action and increase the recovery? So I haven't tested any nanomaterials, but I know there's a couple of companies. Uh, I have a friend who went to work for Nissan, Nissan Chemicals, and that's their big push is to incorporate nanoparticles into the EUR process, whether that's water or gas, or foams um, to try to um, you know, increase the recovery. And those nanoparticles can be different. There's they have a, a, a range of different types of products that do different types of things. I'm not an expert in any of that stuff, but I know that there's some companies out there that are, that are really working on it and showing some potential, I guess I can say. They're showing some potential. In the lab, things work pretty good. I don't personally know of any field trials they may have some that they've done, I don't know, um, but um, I can't say too much about that. I don't, um, I don't know as much about that as, as, um, as others would, but, but I do know that there's potential. Okay, Mr. Holman, which kind of optimization opportunity do you see in this kind of UR technologies? Well, that's another great question. You know, I, I, I kind of touched on it a little bit in the presentation. I think we, the primary frac job is a place where we can optimize our system. Even today, the way we're fracking wells, we're creating too much fracture outside. We wanna create more smaller fractures near the well. But we, when the permeability is 100 nano darcies, we don't need a fracture that's a darcy or even a milli, like if you're getting a milli-darcy fracture or a 10th of a milli-darcy, it's so much more permeable than the matrix that you can actually, um, you can actually get that additional production. The, from the gas injection standpoint, I don't, I think we probably need to start sooner. Not at the beginning, these wells come on at pretty high rates and they're mostly overpressured, but, you know, Pressure is greater than the water gradient. And as that drops down, we, if we go too low, then we got to inject a lot of gas to get the pressure back up. So I think there's an optimization around when to start the gas injection. And I'm thinking it's around a year to two years. But again, every reservoir, every field is a little different. But I, I think most of the cases, they've waited three or four years to do it. And it's still possible, but it just, cost you a lot more money because you need to inject a lot more gas to get back above the pressure where gas will go back into solution. So I think there's some optimization there. Could be something on the cycle times, how long you inject for. You know, do you inject for, you know, 60 days at 10 million or do you inject 30 days at 20 million, right? Is there some kind of process there we could, we might be able to. You know, there's, again, it's all economic. So there's some kind of economic optimization part of that that I think that, that could happen. So, I mean, there could be, you know, there's lots of work. That's as I try to say, like, these are just a couple ideas, but for the most part, we're, we're really at the very beginning of understanding this. So, you know, we can be optimizing all parts of this, um, of this process. Okay, the last two questions. First, uh, you know, what is the gum issue in the world? The, the, the what issue? The war gum. Oh, yeah. Um, so probably half of these wells that I've showed you are slick water fracked. 
So they don't have the guar gum issue as they shouldn't. Um, so I, I haven't confirmed this, but I've talked to some people that think that the main uh, EOR mechanism recovery is you're cleaning out that guar gum. This, you know, the filter cake that's, that's cl clogged up these really tiny pore spaces and we just need to clean that out and that's what's causing adi or additional oil to be produced. Um, and that may be part of it. I don't think it's the whole story because, and the reason I say that, and I, I kind of explain, try to explain this to some other people, I don't know if I did a good job, but when we look at like, you know, this case here, the, um, I can see uh, maybe that was the case for why we're getting this big bump, but then we're getting a second big bump and a third and you know, all these are, are increased. And I would think that if it was just cleaning up that, that damage, we'd see a big bump initially, but then these subsequent cycles would be much, much smaller kind of once we've cleaned it up. So that's why I think at least, you know, part of it or a big part of it is actually gas going back into solution uh, and not just the, you know, frac fluid cleanup issue. All right, um, and the last question. Uh, Mr. Holman, has CDG technology an impact place in the ER for unconventional reservoirs? Uh, which technology, CVG? CDG. Uh, I don't know. I don't know what that is. CBG technology? I don't know either. Okay, well, that's fine. <laughs> Sorry about Julian that. Julian asks, uh, Mr. Holman, I have read about suck time in half and puff operation on shale EOR. They say that shortest cycles will be better to get more oil recovery. This is, could be true and why? Yeah, so yeah, that's a great question too. So the um, in steam injection, we have some soak time. So we inject the steam in these heavy oil reservoirs and it takes some time for that steam to heat up the oil to convert from steam to water. And so there's some soak time is important in, in this huff and puff. For gas injection, really the soak time um, is basically zero. I mean, it's as kind of short as we can make it. So we inject gas, it fills up the fractures. Gas is immediately starting to go into the into solution, into the oil. Um, now, if we waited longer, say we allowed 10 days of soak, more gas would go into the oil. So you may see a slightly more oil production, but not enough to account for that 10 days that the wells are shut in. And so the cost benefit of shutting your wells in, having a long soak time, is not now you may get it a little bit more oil, but 10 days later isn't going to be economic. It's not enough to account for that time. So that's why most of these times we just inject. It takes a day or so to convert from injection to a producing well. So that's kind of the soak time. And then once the wells are ready to go on production, the wells are put back on production. Um, so you know, you, anyway, so we don't, you're right, we, most people don't do soak time or very little soak time. And, um, and it's, I guess, mostly an economic reason. Um, also, the reason we try to inject big compressors is that we want to have as the well shut in as short amount of time possible. Because when we're injecting, we're not producing, right? So we're not getting any additional oil. Um, and so if we can inject with a bigger compressor in 20 days versus a smaller compressor over 40 days, right? It may be worth it to have that expense of that bigger compressor. Um, and kind of, and soak time is, is kind of the same, the same idea. Okay, thank you very much, Todd, for the opportunity. And we hope that you can be here in Colombia very soon. Yeah, I do too. Thank you very much. Fantastic questions. I really enjoyed that. Um, um, and, and here you see my email. So if you have any other things you would like to ask, please send me an email. I'm happy to, uh, to communicate with you. So, and thanks again, Sandra, for organizing this. Bueno, muchas gracias a todos por su participación. Esperamos que la charla haya sido de su agrado. También los invitamos a seguir nuestras redes sociales y así estar pendiente de las actividades que tenemos programadas para todos ustedes. Espero que tengan una buena noche.